Hello and welcome. I'm Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton, and I'm so grateful to have Issa, Issa Banez and Kat Welbeck from the Student Borrower Protection Center here today to discuss recent reforms of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and the Federal Student, student Debt Relief Initiative announced by President Biden, which applications have just opened up for this week. It's clear that the cost of higher education is prohibitive for too many young Virginians, which is why I've made it a my priority in Congress to, to make all pathways to an advanced degree more accessible and affordable. These two programs to alleviate the crushing burden of debt is a good first step, but there's more work to do. That's why I support legislation like the College Affordability Act to bring down, down the cost of education through things like investments in our community colleges and expansion of the use of Pell Grants. Today is the first opportunity for constituents to learn about these debt relief programs. First, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which was created as a way to help ease the burden of student debt for Americans who chose a path of public service which in many cases involves accepting a lower pay than they would likely receive in the private sector. Our public servants, teachers, pub police officers, first responders, social workers, and more, dedicate their careers to making our country better, keeping us safe, helping to educate our next generation of leaders. In order to qualify for the relief provided by the PSLF program, borrowers must first make a series of qualifying payments under specified repayment plans, and then would have the rest of their loans forgiven. Unfortunately, that's far from the reality that has been that has been for the vast, vast majority of those who should be eligible. Complicated requirements and poor management left thousands of borrowers confused and unsure whether their payments were the payments that they're making were, were would qualify. When I came to Congress, I saw what was happening and I heard from my constituents about what they had been through. So I advocated for reforms. While the previous administration refused to take action on reforms that were that we were fighting for, even, even proposed eliminating the PSLF program entirely at one point. Last year, the Biden Department of Education announced long-awaited changes that have already helped tens of thousands of people get their loans forgiven. Additionally, with President Biden's recent, recent announcement of a targeted debt forgiveness program for borrowers in most in need, my office has been receiving many messages from constituents interested in taking advantage of this much needed opportunity. The, this app, the application for this program has just opened, so be sure to check it out at studentaid.gov forward slash debt relief. I'll repeat that, studentaid.gov forward slash Debt relief. I'll let Aisa and Kat explain the eligibility, the eligibility details and how to apply for both of these programs, but I want to say again how pleased I am that both of these initiatives will go a long way towards helping ease the financial burdens for so many in Virginia's 10th district and across the country. You can always count on me to fight for to make higher education and career training programs more affordable and accessible for every young Virginian. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Aisa and Kat who have a brief, brief presentation and then we'll answer questions. We have a number of questions that were pre-submitted prior to the event. If you're tuning in and have additional questions, please drop a comment in the live stream chat. We'll do our best to get to get to as many as we can. If you don't have time to sit around for this entire presentation, don't worry, it will be it will be posted on my website as well as on our social media channels. So don't fear that. Don't fear. You'll still have an opportunity even after today's event to, to view our the contents and learn more about this program. But thank you so much again for joining us. And now over to you, Asa. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Wexton. Uh, it is such a pleasure for my colleague Kat and I to join you today. Um, my colleague Kat will jump in to the presentation once we get to the Q&A portion. Um, but without further ado, um, I would love to get started on our webinar, as, as the Congresswoman had mentioned, which is solely focused on uh, ways that you can access student debt relief, including the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Uh, once again, my name is Aisa Canchula Banyas. I'm a Senior Advisor for Policy and Strategy with the Student Borrower Protection Center. A uh, little background on the SBPC. We are a national nonprofit organization solely focused on alleviating the burden of student debt in this country. We engage in a mix of advocacy, policymaking, and litigation strategy to rein in industry abuses, protect borrowers' rights, and advance economic opportunity for the next generation of students. I'm really excited to speak with you all today. Um, and as a bit of housekeeping, many of you have submitted questions in advance, and we look forward to answering those at the end um, and are looking um, at the end. Uh, please do make sure to submit as many questions as you have in the live chat. Um, and my colleague Kat will be gathering your questions and looking for common themes so that we can answer as many questions as possible this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, so with that, let's get started. So the majority of this presentation, as you will see, will be focused on the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to spend a few minutes on the recent cancellation announcement and application that is now live as a result of President Biden's Student Debt Relief Program. This past August, in recognition of the harmful economic impacts of the student debt crisis, President Biden announced a broad-based student debt relief plan for federal student loan borrowers who meet certain income requirements. 
The plan would provide up to $20,000 in debt cancellation for borrowers who had previously received a Pell Grant to attend college and also meet certain income requirements. The plan would also cancel $10,000 for borrowers who did not receive a Pell Grant, but also meet certain income requirements. In order to be eligible, borrowers must have earned under $125,000 as an individual or $250,000 as a married couple or head of household in either the 2020 or 2021 tax year. For the majority of borrowers who are eligible, an application process will be required, and we'll get more into that uh, those details uh, in a, a future slide. Um, and borrowers will have until December 31st, 2023 to apply. For borrowers who have already shared income information with the Department of Education through enrollment in an income-driven repayment plan, they may be eligible for cancellation on an automatic basis. And we will go into that further on a later slide. As part of this announcement, the administration also extended the payment pause through December 31st of this year and also announced a newly proposed income-driven repayment plan that will drastically lower monthly payments. I will say this new IDR proposal is very much still a proposal um, and we're still waiting on final updates. So make sure to stay tuned for more information uh, in the coming weeks. So as the Congresswoman had mentioned, the application to apply for student loan relief under President Biden's broad-based debt cancellation plan officially went live on October 17th. Uh, the application uh, in just a matter of five days, under five days, uh, more than 12 million borrowers have applied so far. And our goal here at the SBPC is to ensure that all eligible borrowers are able to get relief. So folks can head to studentaid.gov backslash debt relief backslash apply to access the online application form. Um, the department will be accepting applications once again until December 31st of 2023. So we will have about a year, just over a year window to apply. However, please note that borrowers should apply by mid-November in order to have relief processed before payments are expected to resume in January of 2023. So we are always encouraging folks to apply as quickly as they can, especially if they wanna see cancellation applied before the payments resume at the beginning of next year. The application is incredibly quick and easy. Uh, it has taken many borrowers less than five minutes to complete. Um, and at this time, the application is available only in English and in Spanish, um, and a paper form will be made available by the Department of Education soon. All right, so not only is the application quick, it's uh, very easy to complete. Um, so here is what you need to submit your original or to submit your application for consideration. You will need your name, social security number, date of birth, contact information, and a self attestation verifying your income information. Uh, I know there's been some questions on this, um, but please note that the department is going to be verifying information submitted on the back end um, to verify your eligibility and will be reaching out, will may be reaching out to seek more information to verify your income and your eligibility. It is important to include accurate information and the most up-to-date contact information so that you can provide documentation if necessary. Uh, so what's next? You know, after applying, um, what we've heard from the Department of Education is that you will receive a confirmation email from the department. They will then process your application and verify the information that you submitted on your application. Um, once again, keep an eye out on your inbox for any emails from the department requesting further information. And please do make sure to respond as quickly as possible so that you can get your cancellation processed. Uh, if you do not hear anything from the department, you will not need to do anything further um, after, once you've submitted your application. And once the application is processed, you will be notified by the Department of Education via email. Um, and the department will then notify your servicers to apply the cancellation to your loans. Uh, in the meantime, I, I do just want to put a public service announcement out to just make sure that folks are um, being aware of scams. Um, scams are certainly not new. Uh, particularly programs that, you know, will uh, call you on your cell phone and promise support to help you apply for the cancellation program or navigate ways to consolidate your loans or to apply for income driven repayment plans. Um, those are scams and you will never have to pay to get access to debt relief through the Department of Education if you are a federal student loan borrower. So just be 
uh, be cognizant of scams that are running rampant right now and, and do the best you can to protect yourself, um, uh, especially as you're navigating the various uh, debt relief programs. Now let's turn to the loans that are eligible for broad-based cancellation. Um, so as you will remember, borrowers must earn below a certain income level and must have qualifying federal loans held by the Department of Education in order to be eligible for relief. These loans include all federal direct loans. These are subsidized, unsubsidized federal loans, parent plus loans. Um, these are loans taken out by parents to support their children to attend college. Grad plus loans, so loans taken out for graduate education and direct consolidation loans. Other loans held by the department of held by the federal government, I'm sorry. Uh, so these are specifically FELL loans that are held by the Department of Education and Perkins loans held by the Department of Education. So that's the key word here is making sure that these are loans that are held by the department and not by these private commercial uh, lenders. Uh, the additional bucket of loans eligible for relief include all defaulted loans held by the department as well as defaulted loans that are held by commercially service uh, co commercial servicers, so private lenders. So this includes defaulted subsidized Stafford, unsubsidized Stafford loans, defaulted Parent Plus or defaulted Grad Plus loans, and de defaulted Ed Held Perkins loans. Um, one helpful tip that I give to folks, I, I know it can be a little bit confusing to determine what kind of loans you have and whether or not you're eligible. A helpful tip to, to remember when determining whether your loans qualify is if you had loans that were paused over the course of the payment pause due to the pandemic, your loans are eligible for this cancellation program. Um, so as you can see from the red text at the bottom of my slide, um, so as of September 29th, the administration announced that any privately held FELL, so these are loans under the Federal Family Education Loan Program or Perkins loans, not held by ED, are not eligible for relief under this broad-based cancellation program. So what this means is any borrower who may have consolidated these commercially held FELL or Perkins loans prior to September 29th, you are in good shape, you, your loans are, are, are eligible for cancellation, but any person seeking to consolidate these loans post September 29th are not eligible for a cancellation under this program specifically. Um, this does not have any bearings on eligibility for public service loan forgiveness, which we will delve into next, but it is something to be mindful of um, when determining whether you want to apply for the 10 or 20,000 in broad-based debt cancellation under President Biden's uh, new program. So some of you may be thinking, how do I even tell what type of loan I have to begin with? Uh, please don't worry, we have an entire slide dedicated to this later in the presentation, uh, and we'll be happy to discuss any further questions that come up. All right, so without further ado, we can now turn to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, you know, I, and, and just as a quick reminder, I will say at the top that, you know, Bi President Biden's broad-based debt relief program is separate and apart from PSLF. Borrowers seeking to apply to both programs are welcome to if you have eligible loans, um, and borrowers will not be penalized if they're actively seeking PSLF and also apply for cancellation. So these are two separate programs. Um, and so when we uh, we will delve into PSLF and for a bit of background, I would like to talk about the program, you know, as it was created um, and how it functioned in, until recently. Uh, Congress created the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program back in 2007 to help public service workers who were struggling with student loan debt and to make sure that future students and graduates wouldn't be deterred from entering uh, public service fields because of their student loan balance. Put simply, PSLF is the promise that if a borrower works in public service and makes payments for 10 years, the remainder of their debts will be forgiven. No caps on forgiveness, no income requirements, public service for 10 years, you get forgiveness. Uh, but as we'll see, and as the Congresswoman referenced earlier, you know, it was much more complicated than that. Uh, first, I'm going to explain how the program works, then what some of the issues are, and then how you can benefit from the current special and soon to expire waiver period uh, to access your own PSLF student loan forgiveness. So how does PSLF actually work? More than simply working in public service for 10 years, there normally are four specific criteria. First, you need to have a direct loan. That's one of the several federal loan types. Second, you need to be in the correct repayment plan. 
which for this program is generally an income-driven repayment plan. Third, you need to work in a public service field. And finally, you need to make 120 qualifying payments, 10 years worth. Uh, and I will drill down on some of these in a second. Only direct loans qualify for the public service loan forgiveness program under its traditional requirements. Direct loans have been the main federal loan since 2010. So if you took out a loan since then, it likely qualifies. But if you have an older loan, this is, these are those FEL loans, Federal Family Education Loans or Perkin Loans, those do not traditionally qualify. What you can do though, is con consolidate those loans into a new direct loan, which is like refinancing with the federal government and pays off your old federal loan while replacing it with a new federal loan. Under nor the normal program, when you do this, you lose any credit for forgiveness that you earned on the old loans that you're consolidating since you're essentially taking out a new loan. As we'll discuss in a moment, during this special waiver period, this isn't the case. So it's important to know that under the normal program, most people are still blocked out of the program simply because of the type of loan you have. Second, your direct loan needs to be a repayment plan, which is generally an income-driven repayment plan or IDR plan. It doesn't matter how much you're paying, just that it's the right plan. These plans go by names like income-based repayment or IBR, an income contingent repayment plan, ICR, or pay as you earn, pay, and revised pay as you earn, repay. Some other repayment plans can qualify in certain instances, but in general, you want to be on an IDR plan. And third, to get public service loan forgiveness, you need to work in public service. The focus here is on your employer, not your role. You can work at a government organization, so that covers most city, state, and federal employees, a 501c3 nonprofit, or certain other nonprofits. And you also have to work full-time. For determining eligibility for PSLF, the Department of Education defines this as 30 hours a week, or, or what your employer says is full-time, if it's more than 30 hours the 30 hours can be with more than one employer. And finally, you need to make 120 of these qualifying payments, payments on the right loan, payments in the right plan, and during your correct employment. The payments have to be made in full and on time. And if you leave public service and then come back, you can continue accruing credits and don't need to start over. The payments and the time and employment don't need to be consecutive. There have been some impacts of COVID on the public service loan forgiveness program. Uh, first, for those loans getting the payment pause, those owned by the federal government, each month of suspended payments counts towards the 120 total payments and therefore towards PSLF loan forgiveness. However, you still need to meet each of the other three criteria and the most relevant criteria is the public service employer. So as you can see, the program is pretty complex. Um, and so now we'll talk about what's changed in the program under this waiver and why. So and historically, since 2007 uh, or since 2017, which was when the first cohort of PSLF eligible forgiveness was due, the initial rejection rate was at a skyrocketing 99%. Only some 800 applications out of 90,000 were approved. Folks were being denied because they had the wrong loan or weren't in the right repayment plan or some other technical reason that had nothing to do with whether the, or not they actually uh, fulfilled their 10 years of public service. As you can imagine, this was a huge problem and an incredible failure for the public service workers that this program was intended to serve. Many folks took out debt to get the education they needed to be a teacher, a social worker, a government lawyer, specifically because they had been told that after 10 years of affordable payments, the remainder would be forgiven. So in the summer of 2021, the Department of Education, for the first time ever, opened a request for information and asked borrowers to tell them about their PSLF experience. This was essentially an opportunity for the public, to, uh, public service workers to ask President Biden to fix the program once and for all and nearly 50,000 borrowers submitted comments sharing their harrowing experiences with PSLF. This was a huge response to the government's request and had a consistent message. The program isn't working and it needs to change. So within weeks of the request for information, the federal government announced a special waiver that would address many of the systemic issues that these borrowers who filed complaints were facing. 
for a limited period of time, the Department of Ed was going to retroactively grant credit towards PSLF loan forgiveness to borrowers for months that previously didn't count for the program, either because they were in the wrong loan type or weren't making the right payment. And we'll walk through those changes now. Essentially what the department's waiver does is give public service workers a second chance to get the credit towards loan forgiveness that they've earned. Regardless of the type of federal loan they have, for any period of time since October 1, 2007, when the program began, and as long as they were in qualifying public service employment and their loan was not in default, deferment, or forbearance. Even in months in which borrowers did not actively make a payment, as long as the loan was in repayment status, they can receive credit. These credits will be retroactive, so borrowers can receive credit for past payments that were previously ineligible. And in short, for any months since October 1, 2007, that a borrower had any type of federal loan work for a qualifying public service employer and was not in default deferment or forbearance, that borrower can receive credit towards these 120 payments. However, while this waiver is certainly a game changer, unfortunately, it's not completely automatic. Normally, PSLF requires that borrowers have a specific loan type, direct loans, as we discussed earlier. Now, although the waiver allows without direct loans must take steps to convert their loans into direct loans through the process known as consolidation. Even though they will still get credit for time before the conversion, it's still an extra step that needs to be that needs to be taken. And almost all borrowers, regardless of loan type, will have to certify with the Department of Education any periods of qualifying public service work since October 1 of 2007. So the idea here is that if the government does not know when you had qualifying work, it cannot award you the right credits. And importantly, the department's waiver only lasts until Halloween of this year. So we're down to 11 days. That means that any borrower who must change their loan type through consolidation or certify their public service work with the department must do so before October 31st. Now, this does not mean that everyone will receive their new credit towards loan forgiveness by that deadline, just that the paperwork has to be completed, has to be initiated and completed before that time. Credits will be given on a rolling basis, and the department may take more time beyond October 31st, 2022 to process everyone. Although, if you get credits from the waiver, those credits are permanent. So if you did not receive enough to meet the 120 credit requirement, you can continue to accrue more credits after October 31st, adding to those that you received over the course of the waiver. And with that in mind, there are three things all public service workers with federal student loans have to do. To figure out how this special waiver applies to you and what steps individuals need to take, every borrower should do three things. And we'll talk about each, but briefly they are, confirm your past and present employers, our qualifying public service employers, determine your loan types, and consolidate if necessary, and certify your employment. First, we gotta confirm that you have a qualifying employer. Nothing about this requirement changed during the waiver. You still need to work in public service, except for during the waiver period, you don't still need to be employed at the time that you apply for forgiveness after your 120 payments. So if you've since left public service work after 10 years or have since to apply for uh, forgiveness. Remember, qualifying employers include any government employer, federal, state, local, tribal, and any nonprofits that have a 501c3 tax exempt status. Certain other nonprofits also qualify. However, unions and political organizations do not. So any organization whose tax status is a C4 will not be eligible for PSLF, nor do any for-profit employers. If you aren't sure whether your employer qualifies as a public service employer for PSLF, the Department of Education maintains a list of qualifying public service employers that you can search. It's important to note though, that this is not necessarily an exhaustive list. So if your employer does not appear on the list, but you still believe that it's a qualifying public service employer, you can still proceed with the PSLF process. You can access this list by using the PSLF help tool available on studentaid.gov. The employer database is the first step in the help tool, so you can quickly access it to check your past and present employer's status. Step two, what type of federal loans do you have? The three major loans that most folks have today are direct loans, federal family education loans or FEL loans, and Perkins loans. For public service 
workers to get loan forgiveness for their Fell and Perkins loans under the PSLF waiver, they have to consolidate those loans into a direct loan. Remember, what's special about the waiver is that normally when you consolidate your loans, you lose any past credit towards loan forgiveness. But during this special time, an opportunity, which expires in 11 days, uh, you can keep that past credit and apply it to the new consolidated loan. So this is where I will also stop and make sure to remind you the differences between the PSLF program and the Biden debt cancellation program. For consideration under PSLF, Fell and Perkins loans must be consolidated into a new loan, a new direct loan. If you're doing so after the September 29th date, you may lose eligibility for broad-based debt cancellation of 10,000 or 20,000. But depending on your years of service, your outstanding debt load, it may still make sense to consolidate and earn credit towards PSLF, which has no income limit or no income cap and no cap on forgiveness. So every borrower's case is different, um, but we do want to just make sure that you're aware of this dynamic when considering consolidation. And the final step that all public service workers with federal loans should do is certify their qualifying employment with the Department of Education. So remember, qualifying employers are any level of government, 501c3 nonprofit employers, and certain other nonprofit employers. The form to do this is called the PSLF form, um, and but it was previously called an employment certification form. Uh, so that may ring a bell to, to some folks. Borrowers should certify their employment using the PSLF help tool available on studentaid.gov, which is the same tool that you can use to confirm your past and current by you for PSLF. This is the tool that will actually generate the form for you, which your employer will have to sign. So you have to print that out and have your employer sign it. Okay, so we have just discussed the three steps borrowers should take to make sure they benefit from the current waiver. Uh, now I'm going to briefly show you how some of the step-by-step -step instructions look and how to do all of this, starting with confirming your employer is eligible for PSLF. All right, so you will need to log into studentaid.gov. Studentaid.gov is your best friend during this process. Uh, if you do not know your loan information, there is a way to reset, uh, res reset your, your login information and get access. Um, so by doing this, you can hover over uh, Manage Your Loans located at the top toolbar and click on Public Service Loan Forgiveness in the drop down menu. You'll see the PSLF help tool there, which you should click to launch. Borrowers can look up all of their employers since October of 2007 in the help tool by entering their tax employer identification number or EIN and their dates of employment. You can check your employer's EIN by looking at your W-2, by asking your employer, or for some larger employers, by simply using Google. If your employer appears when you run the search, confirmed as a public service employer. So you should proceed to the next steps of the help tool and, uh, and proceed to the next check of, step of checking your loan types or consolidating if necessary. If your employer does not appear, you could still be eligible as this list is not exhaustive. It could mean that no one else from your place of employment has sought PSLF in the past, so do not be discouraged by this, especially if you work for a government agency or a 501c3 nonprofit and that you know should be eligible. Some eligible employers will just show up as ineligible but continue to proceed through the process. Um, okay, so once you've determined whether your employers are eligible, you should confirm the types of loans you have. This can be a bit confusing and many folks don't necessarily know. So to see all of your federal loans, you should log in to your online account with studentaid.gov. You will have a dashboard there that lists all of your loans. Any that say direct are direct loans. Any that don't say direct will have to be consolidated. And for a more granular list, you can download your loan data and you can see on this slide how to navigate this, uh, how to navigate your data. So on the dashboard that lists your loans, uh, you can see the current balance. You can see, uh, so this little arrow here that will um, allow you to break down the loan types and a download, I'm sorry, download your data. Actually, I'm gonna move this back. Okay, here we go. Um, so you can see the types of loans that you have, the outstanding balances, um, and you can see any of the other categories listed here as well. So Perkins or Graduate Plus, et cetera. Um, so if you download your data using the instructions from the last slide, you'll be able to see which ones are direct to direct and therefore require consolidation. 
Now, if you have non-direct loans, um, once again, you will want to consider consolidating them for purposes of PSLF. Let's talk through the process of consolidation. So to consolidate your loans, you'll need to log into studentaid.gov again, hover over manage loans located at the top toolbar and click on consolidate my loans in the drop-down menu. And you can access the consolidation application here. It will then guide you through the steps you'll need to take, which includes selecting which loans you want to include for the consolidation, confirming the amount and the rate of the new loan, selecting your repayment plan and servicer, and then signing for the loan. Now, here is a tip specific to the waiver. If you have a mix of older and newer loans, so some would be closer to the 10 years needed for forgiveness under PSLF, if you consolidate all of the loans together, the new loan will be awarded as much credit towards forgiveness as your oldest existing loan. So if you consolidate old and new loans, when the consolidated loan is ultimately forgiven, the entire amount will be forgiven. So this is a, use, a very useful kind of hack for folks who have older fell loans, uh, but newer direct loans. You might not necessarily think to consolidate your direct loans because they already qualify, uh, but if you do consolidate them, they could be forgiven in the same timeline set for the older fell loans. So that's just an important, uh, important flag that we want to put on folks' radar. So remember, for the regular PSLF program, you need to be enrolled in an IDR plan. So when you're consolidating, it's a good idea to select one of the IDR plans as your payment plan. Some of the names of these plans, as a reminder, are Income Based Repayment, or IBR, Income Contingent Repayment, or ICR, Pay, P-A-Y-E, and Repay, Re-P-A-Y-E. These payment plans within income driven repayment are all different and there is a payment calculator tool that will help you choose the plan among these four that's best for you and your financial situation. Uh, once again, just to make sure that we are making very clear, uh, you know, what the consolidation um, decision could mean for potential eligibility for President Biden's debt relief plan. Um, so if you are considering a new consolidation of Fell, older commercially fell, held fell and older um, uh, privately held Perkins loans uh, into a new consolidated loan after September 29th, those loans will be ineligible for the $10,000 or $20,000 in cancellation under President Biden's broad-based debt relief plan. Um, so, you know, if if this is something that is, um, if, if you are a borrower who has older and privately held fell loans, um, just know that we are going to be, the Student Borrower Protection Center, will be doing a series of webinars uh, specifically to help these borrowers navigate uh, various uh, repayment and um, uh, forgiveness plans available to them. Uh, we will be having one on November 3rd, and you can sign up on our website at protectborrowers.org under events um, and encourage folks if, if this is your situation and you want to hear learn more about what um, what resources and supports are available to you, uh, please make sure to, to, to sign up for that event being held on November 3rd. All right, so finally, let's review how to certify your employment. Just like with confirming your employers, uh, you will need to log into studentaid.gov hover over Manage Loans located at the top toolbar and click on Public Service Loan Forgiveness in the dropdown. We're going back to the public uh, the PSLF help tool and you'll remember this step from earlier. It was the first step in the help tool and this is where you will add your employers. Then the PSLF help tool will guide borrowers through the next steps. Including, certify, including identifying which loans they want to include for the PSLF loan forgiveness. Um, and once you complete each of the tool steps, it will generate a form that you can use to certify your employment. Again, this form is called the PSLF form and is the form you must submit to receive the benefits for the PSLF waiver. Once you have the PSLF form, you will need to have any employer that you're claiming as a public service employer sign the form. Once the form is signed, you must submit it to the designated federal student loan servicer for processing to make sure you get the maximum benefit that you qualify for. And everyone must submit a new form that reflects all of their qualifying public service work by the October 31st deadline to benefit from the waiver. 
If you worked for a nonprofit that is now closed or your employer is refusing to sign the form, there is a box available to check on the form that one of these is the case. So if these are issues that people are encountering, there are ways around them. We just strongly encourage folks to submit their applications um, and so that you're in the queue for consideration. And if there's any further information that, that your servicer needs to have or the department, you can provide that. But um, just, you know, we know that this is a common uh, challenge that folks have been having. Uh, so to send the forms, you're able to fax or mail them in. Um, and the correct mailing address and fax number will be located on the last page of the PSLF form. So we've just talked through how to use the PSLF help tool. And for most borrowers, that's going to be the best option. However, some borrowers might start using the tool and find that for some reason it prevents them from proceeding. Um, and one reason this might happen is if you're the first person from your employer to apply for PSLF, in which they might not have your employer listed in the database as eligible. And in this instance, you might get a notice that you have to wait 30 or 60 days for the department to review and approve your employer before you proceed. There might be other reasons, but at this point, with the October 31st deadline, you don't have 30, 30 to 60 days to wait. So what you can do instead is download the PSLF form PDF and fill it out manually. That form can be hard to find on studentaid.gov, but if you Google Mohila, M-O-H-E-L-A, remember that's the dedicated servicer for PSLF, and PSLF, you'll find their PSLF page. So Mohila PSLF, which you can see here on the left. Um, if you click the employer box in red, it'll bring you to the page on the right where you can download the form on the top right, also in red. Then you can fill it out and have your employer sign it and return it per the instructions that we covered in the last slide. Wherever you get the form, just make sure you're using the correct one. So we don't expect them to change the form again before the deadline in 11 days. So you can confirm that you have the right form by checking that it hasn't expired. You can see here on the top, uh, on the left at the top right of the form, it shows um, August 31st of 2023 expiration date. And also by confirming that the instructions direct you to submit the form to Mohila as the dedicated servicer. That's how you know that it's the most accurate and up-to-date form. So what's the process for getting forgiveness? This is the general process, but it applies for the waiver too. Mohila is currently the exclusive servicer for public service loan forgiveness. However, all PSLF accounts are in the process of being transferred to Mohila. So borrowers seeking PSLF need to send the PSLF form to Mohila, which will do a preliminary review of the loan eligibility. And if you have a qualifying loan, your loan will then be transferred to Mohila for servicing at which point it will run through the other criteria such as employment and qualifying payments. And unfortunately, you know, there have been a lot of problems with people finding out too late in the game that they thought they qualified um, for PSLF, but that they had something wrong. So for this reason, we really advise you to submit a form as soon as you're interested in potentially earning uh, a credit towards PSLF. Um, and then do that every year until you qualify for forgiveness. Um, and that every time you change public service jobs, submit a new form so that you, so that folks can spot issues quicker and in real time. Um, so you don't have to document everything over the last 10 years, uh, but rather, you know, slowly sending in information as your earning cancellation will allow you to spot issues and correct um, discrepancies uh, as, as you go along. So the department has also stated that they're continuing to review PSLF cases on a rolling basis. So I know some folks have probably applied already and are just waiting to hear back. Um, unfortunately, there's no real exact and firm timeline on when you'll receive notification from them. What we do know is that they're processing these on a rolling basis um, and to just to make sure that your contact information that you're providing is accurate uh, so that you can get updates uh, when, when they're made available. So now we'll talk about some of the common issues that borrowers have faced pertaining to the waiver and how you can best address them. All right, so when you submit your PSLF form or your employment certification form, it's important that you make sure the form is clean and easy to read. If your employer has written over or tried to correct things after signing the form, 
just request a new clean application from them. Um, often if anything is crossed out or written over, like in this picture on the slide, um, the form will automatically be rejected or the time that you worked for this employer will not be counted as part of your application. So on the front end, just make sure your application is clear, easy to read. Just don't give it, make their, just reduce any opportunity to have your application um, uh, rejected. Um, your application could be delayed or rejected if you submit the form as is. So with scribbling from your employer, just request a clean one and, and make sure to submit on time. When borrowers complete the PSLF help tool, the form suggests that a borrower must take their loans out of an administrative forbearance under the payment pause, stating the following under the subheading, get out of deferment or forbearance. Um, so some folks have just, you know, raised this with us and have flagged that it does contribute a little bit to, you know, some confusion. Um, so just as a bit of background, because student loans were placed in an administrative forbearance under the payment pause due to COVID, um, and payment and, and pause payments continue to count towards PSLF eligibility, borrowers will not need to stop postponing payments in order to make qualifying payments. So although the form on this um, states that a borrower does not need to remove their loan from, a, from the payment pause, we understand how this language is confusing. So just make sure that you know, don't be um, discouraged if you read this, you know, there's nothing that you need to do on, on your part um, as a result of the COVID forbearance policy. So if you choose to use the PSLF tool to complete your PSLF application, many borrowers are unsure on how to proceed when they get to the question on this slide in particular. Um, so if you think you've all, you have already made over 120 payments, the PSLF help tool might not let you choose that option. Um, this is okay. Uh, just ignore this and choose no, I have not made 120 qualifying payments and move on. We don't want this question to hold you up from taking the necessary steps to submit your application and get your application in the queue. Um, no matter what you select, your account is, and the information you provide will still be verified um, in full by the Department of Education. So just get your application in the queue for processing. And finally, uh, from what we've seen, notices with inaccurate PSLF payment counts have been one of the biggest sources of confusion and frustration with the PSLF help tool. So if you are consolidating an older FEL loan in order to take advantage of the PSLF waiver, you will receive a letter from Fed Loan Servicing after the consolidation is complete, noting that you have one qualifying PSLF payment. Uh, do not worry if you receive this letter. Um, here is what's actually happening. So this is an auto-generated letter that is hard-coded to review, excuse me, um, under the standard PSLF program that we reviewed at the beginning of the presentation. So when you consolidate your loans, you'll be asked, um, you know, if you're doing so to take advantage of PSLF. And since you are consolidating for purposes of PSLF, you'll say yes. And after your consolidation is complete, Mohila will then notify the department, who will then review your account to determine how many qualifying payments you've made towards the PSLF waiver. You will then receive a second letter from Mohila saying how many payments you have towards the waiver. So as mentioned before, this process can take a few weeks to a few months to complete, um, and the department does do these in batches. So there's no concrete timeline when you'll receive notice, but just make sure always, you know, keep paper copies for your records and, you know, so that you have your, your, um, your proof of submissions, et cetera, um, to, and, and just make sure that you're, you're getting your submissions in um, ahead of this, of this waiver deadline. All right, uh, so some important takeaways here. Um, let me just get this. Uh, so credit, you know, under this waiver, you know, uh, public service workers have the opportunity to get credit during months uh, that traditionally had not been available to earn credits um, for PSLF. Uh, another important deadline or takeaway is that this deadline for this special waiver period is set to expire on October 31st. This applies to the special uh, privileges that come with consolidating your loans. Um, so making sure that you make that request to consolidate, that you generate your PSLF form and get that process started before that deadline. Um, and so this also includes confirming your employer, confirming your loan types, uh, consolidate if necessary, uh, submit your PSLF form. And if there are any challenges that you face along the way, uh, there are places that can help you if you need help. So the 
federal student aid has a complete system that you can uh, raise your hand if you're experiencing issues. Um, and then last but certainly not least, please be aware of scams. You do not have to pay folks to navigate the system. Um, these are rights that you have as you know federal borrowers and um, you do not have to pay to, to get this assistance. Um, okay, so with that, I know I have shared a lot of information, uh, but there's a lot of exciting opportunities coming. And so we just wanted to make sure folks had all the information they needed. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Justin and welcome my colleague Kat uh, for any questions that we um, are able to answer in the remaining time. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for your time, Justin. Before before you before you start your questions that we are from the audience, I'm going to take I'm going to take Congresswoman's prerogative and ask you guys <laughs> quick ones myself because I just am curious for my own edification. Absolutely. There's a lot of information you, you've sent to us, and I, I hope that people who are listening who have these loans, you know, know exactly what loan type they have and, and were able to pull out exactly what they needed from it. But I had a couple of questions for you. So so for the debt relief portion of it, the $10,000 of debt relief, mm -hmm. um, how and let's say I have two two federal loans that I'm one applied to. One is a Perkins loan with like $7,000 and a lower interest rate. One is a Stafford loan with, I don't know, ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and a higher interest rate. How would they how would they come up with the priority of applying the ten thousand dollars to those? Obviously, I would rather they go to the one with the higher interest rate, but I was just concerned that they might pay down and pay off the one that has the lower interest rate or the, the smaller one first, pay it off completely, and then then pay off the other pay what but you know what they can towards the remainder of the, the debt on the other loan. Which how do they how do they prioritize prioritize where it would go? That's a great question. And I will say, you know, everybody's scenario and, 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 and circumstances are different, right? So I think the biggest thing to be cognizant of when determining what you want to apply, you know, whether you want to apply for the broad-based debt cancellation program is whether or not you have qualifying loans. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say the forgiveness or the cancellation under President Biden's debt cancellation plan will first be applied to interest and then the outstanding balance. So if you have a qualifying loan, it does make sense to look at the loans with the higher interest rates and you know if it's a qualifying loan to, to apply and so that that way you have your outstanding balance wiped out and um, and your higher interest rate um, is, 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 you know, uh, taken care of within that with, within that cancellation. I one of the things that I do want to just stress that if it is a privately held loan, um, you know, and you're considering potentially applying for cancellation under the broad based cancellation program, just be mindful of whether or not those th those are qualifying. Um, but if they are qualifying, you know, really, you submit your application, the Department of Education also determines the type of how it applies the cancellation. So regardless of how the borrower would like to have the cancellation applied, um, the department will go through, apply it to outstanding interest, apply it to outstanding um, the, the loan balance, and then apply it to the loans with the highest interest rates and move down from there. Gotcha. Thank you. And then one other, one other quick question. For the public service loan forgiveness program, when they need to consolidate into a new direct loan in order to qualify for this forgiveness, and, and I know that time's time's a waste and you know time is of the essence in this. You know, do you believe that they will that they will that they will actually act on the consolidation in time for for this all to be in one one you know in one big in one big uh, process before we get to the deadline, or is it something that once you apply, then then you can still apply for the other for the other forgiveness? Yes. So. We oh go ahead, Kat. Go on ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was giving you a break because I know you. <laughs> so much Thank you, Kat. <laughs> That's a really great question, and we and we get this question a lot more as we kind of get to the last point of the waiver. It's all about getting yourself in line. So we know that, um, and as Aisa mentioned during the presentation, consolidations can take a couple of weeks, um, and so your consolidation might not be complete by the time the waiver, um, by the time we hit the waiver deadline. But as long as you start your consolidation or you submit your PSLF form by that October 31st deadline, the Department of Education will consider you in line a part of the, the waiver process. So it's really important. You still have time. I used to say again, 11 days. So at least start that consolidation if you're someone who needs to consolidate your loan or if you're someone who needs to certify your employment, please submit that um, PSLF form by that deadline and, and you'll still be able to get in line for the waiver. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, Justin, all yours, take it away. Well, thanks so much, Congressman, and thanks for the super uh, informative presentation. Uh, we have a few questions about the public service loan forgiveness program that we're going to start out with. The first one comes from Felicia in Frederick County, who says, I'm a nurse and have worked for a nonprofit healthcare system for over 30 years. Um, why are Parent PLUS loans excluded from the PSLF program? 
this is a really great question. I so let me know if you want me to jump in or if you want to jump in here at all. But um, that's actually really that's a really great question. So one thing I will make a really important distinction: um, Parent Plus borrowers can benefit from the pu public service loan forgiveness. So as the program typically works, that I outlined in the very very beginning the beginning of the program, unfortunately, Parent Plus loans were not included in the waiver. So while Parent Plus borrowers may not be able to benefit from these relaxed rules that we've had for the past year, what people who um, have Parent Plus loans can do, um, the important part, if you remember, Isa said, in order to take advantage of public service loan forgiveness, you have to be in an income driven repayment plan. And generally, Parent Plus loans don't have access to IDR plans, but if you have a Parent PLUS loan, you consolidate that loan into a direct loan, you'll have access to a plan called an Income Contingent Repayment Plan, an ICR plan. It's a type of IDR plan that Aisa outlined earlier. And so with that ICR plan, you can then accrue credit towards public service loan forgiveness. So in essence, so yes, technically you actually can as a Parent PLUS borrower, there's just an extra step that you have to take to take advantage of the traditional rules of this public service loan forgiveness program. But it's a really great question and we get that all the time. Thank you so much. Our next one here um, asks, I already provided a PSLF form to my direct loan provider in August of 2022. Will this one-time forgiveness application cancel out the PSLF application I submitted as the PSLF is full forgiveness since I worked for a, ten, a nonprofit for 10 plus years? That is a great question. Um, and just in short, no, they will not cancel one another out. Um, these are two separate programs. Uh, submitting a request for cancellation and, and working towards your PSLF forgiveness will not penalize you in any way um, as you are attempting, you know, if you do also apply for the 10 or 20,000 in broad based debt cancellation. Um, so please do not be uh, worried about that. Uh, you know, if that is something that, that you want to apply on the side, we, we welcome folks to do that. And that could also, you know, impact the um, the amount of time towards towards eventual forgiveness that you see through through PSLF. So, you, you will not be penalized uh, by applying for for the broad based debt cancellation if you have an ongoing application for PSLF. Thanks so much. Uh, a couple more public service loan forgiveness ones. Uh, my husband and I uh, combined our student our student debt balances to help lower our monthly payments, and I was told I would not be able to apply for PSLF. Is that true? I guess I want to direct the spousal consolidation to you, but I, I know this one's a little bit tricky, so there's a possibility we might need to follow up specifically on that one. I believe so. So it it depends on the specific consolidated loan that you took out um, and what the whether it's ed held or commercially held. So what I would love to do is follow up with the Congresswoman's team to see if we can get some additional information from you and then we can kind of direct you in the right uh, direction. But that is a very, very important question. And we want to make sure that you get the answers that you need. Thanks so much. We appreciate that and can definitely do that. We'll, we're happy to follow up. Um, one additional PSLF question here. I'm having trouble getting my student loan service, service provider to acknowledge payments that should count towards PSLF. What are my options? Wow, that is a really great question. And this is something that Aisa outlined in the, in the last slide of the takeaway. If you're experiencing trouble, um, definitely complain. Um, and we could be sure to follow up to make sure that everyone here has email information for the federal student aid office within the Department of Education. So you can submit a complaint to the ombuds person and say, you know, your student loan servicer isn't responding about, you know, payment counts. You, you, you believe you have more payments um, than they're actually saying for the waiver. Also, um, just another thing, just to verify, making sure that this person also because I don't know all the background of your um, your specific scenario. Also, just making sure that you do have a PSLF form on file for all of the employers that could be qualifying employers since 2007, just to make sure you have all those periods accounted for. And then also maybe just do one more check of your forms yourself so you can make sure that your employer did certify, seeing the reason why they may not um, have counted those payments, whether it's the example that I used to sent where someone may have crossed out some information or there might be a missing signature on your form. So it's also really important to too, when you get that letter from your servicer saying what your updated payment account is, you're also looking at the reason um, what it might be. And just, you know, just in case, because we're in the waiver period, if you need to really quickly resubmit forms, just to make sure you have everything um, in line. But again, I will just repeat, 
definitely file a complaint. Um, I would say with this really short period of time, go to the Ombuds office at Federal Student Aid, um, but you could also file a complaint with uh, the CFPB as well. I, just, I don't know if you had anything else to add there, but. That was perfect. Thanks so much. So a few, since we have a couple minutes left, we have a few just general loan forgiveness questions. Uh, this is about the um, the President Biden's federal debt relief program. And I think we've already covered this, but just to reiterate for folks, when will the process begin and what can we expect in terms of timeline? Yes, great question. So as of October 17th, this past Monday, the application is officially live. Um, it's available online. You can apply on your cell phone. It takes less than five minutes to submit your application. Um, the so what we do know from the department is that folks can expect to get uh either get a confirmation email from the department of ed and can expect to see cancellation processed over uh, the next few weeks um it could take a few weeks to process and make sure that the verification process on the back end goes through and that the, the department of ed gets whatever information they might whatever additional information they might need from you um but i will say you know while the application process will be open through december 31st of 2023 if folks want to see cancellation applied to their accounts before payments resume in January of 2023, make sure to apply before November, uh, before the middle of November, in order to get the queue and and to make sure that your uh, cancellation is is processed in time. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, a couple other questions here: Will the ten thousand dollar forgiveness be applied against both the interest and the principal balance owed? That is right. Uh, so as the Congresswoman had had asked be before in terms of, you know, how to make determinations on loans with the higher interest rate and uh, higher loan balance, et cetera. So at how the department is going to be moving forward with applying the cancellation is that they will first apply it to the interest and then apply it to the outstanding balance owed. Um, and so the department has also released guidance on the order in which cancellation will be applied if you have several different loans. Um, with various outstanding balances below, let's say 20,000, and you were a Pell Grant recipient, um, for example. Um, so if you want to dig in a little further, it does get a, a little bit weedy. But if you do want to dig a little bit further into that, I would suggest heading to forgivemystudentdebt.org. Um, this is a website overseen by the Student Borrower Protection Center. Um, and we've put together a very exhaustive list of frequently asked questions that specifically provides a detailed rundown of how they will apply cancellation across multiple loans for a borrower. And that will be your best bet of understanding how that process will will, will, um, will pan out. Fantastic. We have just a couple minutes left here. Um, so two more short questions. Uh, this person asks, I have both an FFELP loan and a DL loan. Will they both be eligible for forgiveness? So this here really depends on whether your FEL loan is commercially held. So is this a, held by a private you know, bank or lender or whether or not it is held by the Department of Education. Um, it also depends on whether your FEL loan is in default. If it is in default, it's it's eligible for cancellation under you know, broad based uh, debt cancellation, President Biden's debt cancellation announcement. Um, if it's ed held, it is eligible. If it is not, if it's commercially held, um, then it is ineligible for this broad-based cancellation program. However, if you are in a public service job and are pursuing forgiveness under PSLF, it could still be eligible if you consolidate um, your loans into a direct loan. So I just wanted to stress that. Very helpful clarification. Thank you. And then finally, um, this person asks, what could happen if current lawsuits against this debt forgiveness program do hold up? And how might that affect their application or, or how they should go about um, applying? Right. That's a great question. I know that this is definitely, you know, unfortunate efforts to block this really life changing relief from constituents and from, you know, borrowers of all walks of life. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, we are moving full force in making sure that folks have the information they need and apply to get in line for relief. Um, you know, I will say that the the 
Department of Justice and the Biden administration, um, you know, has really put together a very compelling defense of their legal authorities under the, that, you know, underpin this this program. Um, so, you know, and as is evidenced by the administration moving forward with um, unveiling the application, you know, I we know that they are confident in this program being able to kind of see through to fruition, as are we. And so we are moving forward with making sure as many folks are able to apply and benefit here. Um, so, you know, we are not letting these really kind of overtly um, uh, harmful efforts undermine our work to make sure folks get relief. Awesome. Thanks so much. That uh, expires our time and we got to just about all of our questions as well. So I'll kick it back to the Congresswoman. Thank you both so much for all this information. It was really exhaustive and I'm glad that you actually anticipated my final question, which is where can people go if they still have other questions? So it's good to hear that you have, it's forgive my student, forgive my student loan or forgive my student debt.org. What's, what's the final, can you give me that website again? For, forgive my student debt.org. You have a lot of FAQs there. Yes, and I can actually drop them in if this is the right chat. So everyone has this here. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you all so much for being with us today. You know, folks who, who still have these debts and really want to get them forgiven, good luck. I hope that you are very, very successful. I'm glad that we got this extension. I'm glad we had this webinar. If you have any questions, please reach out to my office and we'll see if we'll be able to help you. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you both for being here. Kat, Aisa, you guys are fantastic. You have so much information. You guys are a wealth of, of a great information. Thank you for everything you do to make, to make a student borrowing more affordable here in, in the U.S. Thank you so much and take care and everybody have a good day.